yet another solar powered garden wall light but this time it's an extreme one with 100 LEDs and this was available in a couple of different versions you had the one with the individual surface mount LEDs on a circuit board with this sort of housing this sort of shroud and reflector with a hole for every single LED that's quite complex but they also had presumably the much cheaper simpler to make version where they've just got pre-shaped cob arrays which they can just get the manufacturer to deposit them onto the sort of aluminum back PCB and then just slot them in I'm not sure which is the most expensive to make this one has a little solar panel on top it's quite a small solar panel I have to say particularly given it's got 100 LEDs I wonder how long that's going to last let's peel this off the little protective film revealing what's underneath which it's quite a field to protect so this uh, this is uh, got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven about 5.5 volts that's allowing for the charge uh, the voltage under full sunlight 5.5 volts minus a diode to charge the lithium cell not sure what circuitry it's got in it and um, once covered you've got the three modes you get the full intensity when it's disturbed and i have to say i don't know what voltage the battery is at at the moment because it keeps re-triggering when you're not in the room uh, it's got the low level setting that i think may also yes it's got detect and then it's got just a, a medium level setting all night long with no detection and off um, it does have dust detection, it does have passive infrared detection I would rate this solar panel, it's not generous, I'd actually only rate it about 50 milliamps out But we'll check that uh, Let's just start opening it So, first of all, the listing it came off Wade Lywin uh, This one was from a warehouse, Chinese warehouse in Dublin, Ireland, supposedly it costs £6.39 inclusive of shipping, which is really low in the UK. It doesn't, you know, give much confidence to what's inside. Uh, you get the instruction sheet with it in the box. Let's get the box out of the way. Mm -hmm. Solar interaction wall lamp. Um, anything really. It's got Chinese instruction on one side, British on the other. Let's just take it apart. That's the best thing. That's what we got this for. So let's just nudge down just a tiny bit to get better framage. And we'll get the screwdriver into it. So I kind of have a feeling that maybe, uh, depending on the charge that's uh, on this battery, I've not given this a charge in sunlight. Uh, depending on the charge that's in the battery, that might be the problem with the fact it keeps re-triggering when it's at the uh, in it first setting, the one where it lights at full intensity. And that might be because at full intensity it's drawing the enough current to pull the battery voltage down below the level of a voltage regulator perhaps. And then when it turns off, that voltage recovers and it immediately triggers the passive infrared detector again. Let's uh, hike this out. We have an 18650 lithium cell, that's good. Let's get that out. I'll take both these screws out. I think this could just be rotated out of the way, but let's lift it out to see what we've got. Any markings? No. I want to test this and see what its capacity is. There is no protection in this. Hopefully there will be protection in the circuit board. Uh, here are the circuit board panels. Do you know what's really weird? The back ones are, all the LEDs are in parallel. The back ones are the standard fiberglass, but these look like resin bonded paper. Oh, do you know what else is interesting? Because the plastic has been moulded at a certain angle, the fixing post, they've slid the circuit board down posts that are coming from a specific angle here and then they've sort of heat staked them but they've slid the circuit boards on slide sideways onto these posts that's quite weird is this all one plastic housing uh, let's get the circuit board out oh i can see a screw there holding a clear thing oh let's uh, get these two screws out two tiny screws i'll note that in case i need that when i'm putting it back together if it's good enough to put back together Oh, right, okay, so this is one solid plastic moulding. That will be why they've uh, moulded it in the such direction so it can come out the mould that these pins are sticking up the way. But that also makes it quite complex, the actual, the, all these holes for it. Here is the circuit board. Now, before I go any further, well, we've got the passive infrared detector on this. Where's the light sensor? 
Oh, I know what the light sensor is. They're using the solar panel again. Here's the little silicon thing. It doesn't feel that waterproof. It's one of these things that water's just going to get in and it's going to die. Uh, right, tell you what, I'm going to take a picture of this and we'll reverse engineer it and see what makes it tick. Reverse engineering complete and some candy bar taken off. Uh, this time it was sent by Patrick in Dusseldorf in Germany. I'm guessing that the Rebo Pico Bola, does that mean small balls, little balls? But um, it's a sort of extruded, it's made in the same way as the licorice, but with a sort of cream bit in two layers. And it's all obviously extruded out as one. See, I've, uh, I've reverse engineered this as well. Mm, into the mouth it goes, that's a terrible idea while making a video. Now you'll just hear mastication. Here's a circuit board. Let's take a look at the components on it. We have the incoming supply from the solar panel, and it goes through a diode, and there's a couple of resistors that lead to the form of potential divider. This is the correct circuitry. This is what the last one that I took a look at was terrible, should have had. And it goes to the ubiquitous 8-pin microcontroller. Now, the pinout is not the same as the paduk. Uh, this pin here appears to be the plus supply. Um, and that appears to be the negative in that corner, so diagonal opposing corners of power. Hmm. Um, the passive infrared sensor is that new type where everything is built into the can here. It's not just the sensor putting out an analog signal. It's actually putting out a digital signal with timing. So it's got the lens in the front, the polythene lens, that creates that strong contrast as you move in front of it into a series of, like, spikes. And it detects that and adds the time delay, and it just signals straight back to the processor with some filtering. It's got a 3-volt regulator over here, 3.3-volt regulator. It's got the transistor here, switching the output via these shockingly low-value resistors. These are 0.5 ohm each, two of them in parallel, 0.25. It pulls the voltage of the battery down really dramatically. In fact, if you uh, if you connect to a bench power supply and adjust it to the point that you have 4.2 volts present at the battery contacts, it's passing 1.5 amps, and this little A2SHB MOSFET gets very, very hot indeed. It is not happy at that. And this uh, battery protection chip also gets pretty hot. Uh, the battery protection chip is reminiscent of a DW01 type protection chip with a, the sense resistor and capacitor, but I've got this schematic. I can show you this all in great detail. If you want to take a look at this, freeze frame, whatever, take a snapshot, then we'll go on to the schematic of it next. Oh, the other thing I should mention there is the button just leading straight to an input. Oh, and mystery resistor here, R8, leading to a pin. Suggesting it might be for setting an option, I tried a low-value resistor across it, nothing changed, so that option is not fitted. Let's bring in the schematic. Let's tame that down just a wee tad. Is that fitting in? That is roughly fitting in. That's fine. So the unit has three modes. Mode 1... The LEDs, with the pulling the voltage of the battery down, it draws about 1.1 amps with a four uh, battery at about 4 volts, but the battery voltage and the wiring will drop because uh, a bit of voltage because uh, under that current because these resistors are really too low. When you put it into mode 2, it goes in an ambient low-level load with just 30 milliamps, which is very good, and then goes up to the 1.1 amp when you actually disturb it, when you actually walk in front of it. The third mode is just at a continuous level. I guess it's you're not going to leave it on like this all the time because it, at 350 milliamps, it's basically drawing current from the battery is about, I would say, about seven times as fast as the solar panel could have charged them during the day. So that's useful if the thing is holding a good charge in the battery and you've got some friends around, you just want to click that button into that mode and just have it on, knowing that uh, it's going to take a while to recharge afterwards. Uh, I shall just uh, tame that exposure down just a tad at the end there because it's looking a bit hot at the tap. We have the solar panel here, the miserable little solar panel, 50 milliamp, I'd guess. I did put it up under my lights here and got a maximum of 40 milliamps out of it. It goes through a diode to the lithium cell. The lithium cell does have this protection chip. I'm not sure the protection chip is. It was marked 32T111. And it has two components. It's got a 100 ohm resistor and a capacitor across the lithium cell with this little tap off there. And that's to, that's a bit of a filtering to measure the voltage across that cell so that it gets a nice stable 
uh, voltage. It's not going to go into like oscillation or something, or or misread the battery voltage if it's under load. Um, or the, it's a switching load. It just gives it a nice smooth reference voltage. So this chip here, when the battery reaches about 4.2 volts or just above it, if it's based on the DW on it, it'll be about 4.25. This will then stop that charging and everything will just continue as normal, but it will just stop the current from the lithium, uh, from the solar panel from charging the lithium cell. Likewise, if the voltage goes too low, and I reckon it would start going unstable below about 3.3 volts anyway, because that would be below the regulator. If it goes as low as, say, 3 volts, or in, in the case of the DW1, about 2.5 volts, then this will shut off the lithium cell anyway and wait till it's charged again. The current limiting, it's not got any current regulation, is purely what the solar panel can deliver. So it's about 5.5 volts at 50 milliamps. There are two resistors across the solar panel, a 100k and a 51k. That's effectively the potential divider where the output voltage here will be a third of the voltage from the solar panel. And that, uh, I've marked at dusk, goes across and it goes to the input of the microcontroller, dusk. Input to that, and that means the microcontroller can actually monitor the light level by looking at the voltage coming from the solar panel. The 4.2 volts across the lithium cell goes straight to the LEDs, but it also goes to this 3.3 volt regulator marked 662K, which claims 3.3 volts at 500 milliamps, which seems a lot of current for such a tiny regulator. There's a decoupling capacitor across the output. Then the passive infrared and the microcontroller each have a 3.3 volt supply. 3.3 volt. Uh, this is going to be about 4.2 volt max, this one because it's just across the lithium cell. And they've got a connection to the sort of zero volt rail. And the pass infrared, its output, it's got that built-in circuitry in it that, you know, it's going to just provide a logic level output, but it's got a pull-down resistor of 47K and a decoupling capacitor just to remove any transients. I guess there must be transients. Normally I'd expect if, they had, if it had internal pull-up or this had internal pull-up, uh, or down, should I say, that it would just be a direct link across, but they've added these components as a precaution, presumably. There's a button input, that's the clicky button that switches between the, the three modes and off, and it's just pulling one pin, the microcontroller, up to the positive rail. The microcontroller then has that little mystery resistor I've not drawn in that goes to the zero volt rail, I'll put a question mark next to, I think that's an option. The output then goes to the MOSFET. The MOSFET is a standard A2SHB, so common. It's one of the Chinese favourite uh, MOSFET transistors. It's dirt cheap. You can buy rolls off of them for about a penny each. They're just really super cheap, chunky, robust little uh, transistor, although you can really give it a bad time in this circuit if you're using really low resistors and a really low impedance supply battery source. Uh, it's got a 10k resistor down to the zero volt rail to make sure that it's always pulling that off. It just biases the MOSFET off to make sure it doesn't go into a sort of semi-conducting state, a partially on state. And the microcontroller then overrides that and just drives it up to the higher level that turns it on. These two resistors, to be honest, one of the best improvements you could make to this would just be to actually remove one of these resistors off the board completely and just leave a single 0.5 ohm because that would cut the current down quite dramatically and it would extend the lifespan. You've got that option if you do have one of these modules. And you, well, let's actually, rather than bring the whole thing in, let's bring this in. If you have one of these modules and you want extra battery life out of it, if it's, you know, being triggered quite a few times, just desold, just stick your solder, soldering iron across this resistor here and just slide it off the circuit board. And that will pretty much almost half the current. It won't completely half current because everything else is being so stressed that that's probably limiting the current as well, but it will make a difference. You've got your 100 LEDs. 100 LEDs. All in parallel. Um, they are connected to the battery out voltage. Uh, the current flows through the LEDs, through that current limiting resistor, through the uh, MOSFET, and that's what turns the LEDs on. And when it runs them at lower level, it just pulses, modulates them, it switches them on, on and off at high speed. So for instance, in a, its 350 milliamp mode, it's probably switched them on for roughly 30% of the time. And in the 30 milliamp mode, it's probably 
Um, let's see, what would that be? One amp divided by that 30 milliamp. It would be a sudden, a sudden brain fog. Yeah, it, it would be a small percentage. I'd have to calculate that. Uh, is that, that's not even, it's about 30%, is it? I think so. Yeah, it would be, uh, no, it would be 3% output. Um, so it really, it just pulses them very uh, short duty cycle just to get that ultra low intensity between enabling. So th the reason for the 3.3 volt regulator and the decoupling capacitor here is that if the circuitry didn't have that regulator to provide a nice stable supply to the passive infrared detector on the chip, then you'd get a situation where the battery voltage is pulled down and usually recovers slowly afterwards. So you get a situation where if the LEDs had been at high intensity and then it turned them off, the battery voltage had been pulled down, it would start recovering again, you'd get a voltage fluctuation in the line and that would cause potentially cause the passive infrared detector because it, it works at very tiny little signal levels internally. It could cause false triggering. By using the 3.3 volt regulator, it means that this uh, rail can bounce up and down as much as it wants, you're going to get a stable voltage out this side. Although I will say that as supplied, I'm not sure what charger is in the battery. The battery is currently on charge to test it for capacity. I'll put the capacity in the description down below. But um, as supplied, when put into its full intensity mode, it was doing that thing that if you... Uh, if you set it and then you walked out the room, it was lighting and then after a time delay it was going out and then after a small delay it would trigger itself again then go out and it just kept doing that. And that suggests that as the battery voltage got low, it may have been close to this or it was just the high current was pulling the battery low. Um, that was probably causing that instability and it was going below the battery voltage, going below the, the level at which that regulator could provide stability. It's textbook. Um, the only bit I don't like is the choice of resistors over here. They were getting very hot. When I ran it off the bench power supply, this little transistor I decided not to continue when it got to about 120 degrees Celsius, which is a bit too hot for our transistor. And uh, the even the set of protection chip was getting very hot at that point. Um, I get the feeling, in fact, that it may actually have been triggering and cutting out because it, it was detecting effectively an overload because it's just designed for fairly low currents. I don't know, because uh, I couldn't find 32T111, couldn't find it. 662K, yes, I could find it, but not this. But there we go. I think I've covered everything here. It'd be interesting, is this diode going to be a shot key diode? We can check that with the meter. We can stick it to the diode test. And if it's roughly about 0.6 volts, uh, that is an ordinary diode. But if it's closer to about 0.2, it's shot key. So, yeah, that's a shot key diode. So that's good. That's this little diode here because uh, I'll just write shot key. Well, just SD. Uh, say about 0 0.3 volts if you push it under current load. Um, that uh, is good because it means that, that it's going to be more efficient than an ordinary silicon diode, slight risk of uh, a bit of reverse leakage, increased reverse leakage compared to a silicon diode, but the advantage of it is that even as the sun's going down, it's not going to deduct too much voltage off that solar panel. Everything is it's going to optimise that for charging this lithium cell. So there we go. It's interesting. It is proper textbook design. I'm going to remove one of those resistors and I'm going to put this back together and uh, I'll let you know the capacity of that cell once it's finished charging. I'm going to make a wild guess that it's going to be one amp hour, as many of them are. But there we go. It seems nicely made. It's completely not waterproof at all. Water will probably get in, it'll probably die. But you guys know that you can make these things more waterproof by using lacquer or even spraying some sort of solvent into these to actually, not solvent, but an oil or something, just to coat things. Being careful not to get it in the front of this, the window of this, because that can actually affect its ability to see heat. And that switch there will probably corrode. That's just one of the many things that happens. These things are not designed with longevity in mind, are they? But there we go. It's a good basis for uh, working on adapting, even if just to buy the circuit board module and use it as a controller for your own lighting. But there we go. Interesting little circuit.